Good morning, everyone. I have a confession to make. I spent the last two days listening to presentations, reading the materials, talking to a few of you, eavesdropping on most of you, and engaging in my favorite conference activity, which I like to call intellectual shoplifting. And what I've discovered over the past couple of days of absorbing all of the information is this has reaffirmed my sense that this is a great time to be us. We've got the winds at our back. We've got opportunities that would have been unimaginable in any other time in the history of the world. In fact, if you were an outsider looking in, you might assume that the biggest challenge we have in our field is managing our extensive wait lists. Well, I don't know about you. That, unfortunately, is not my biggest problem. I'm guessing it's not your biggest problem. And if I read the NIC data of 90% occupancies, I think that's pretty accurate. And so you'd have to ask yourself the question, why is that true? Why is it that 90% of the population isn't looking at what you have to sell and what I have to sell? What is it they're rejecting? What is it they're looking for? But you think about the wind at our backs today. It's startling, isn't it? 10,000 people turn 65 every day. As Bob Kramer put it to me yesterday, we're minting a new customer every 60 seconds in this country. We'll have more people over the age of 65 than under the age of 15 for the first time in history. I mean, it is just startling, the opportunity we have in front of us. So how do we tap into that 90% who aren't looking at us? And this is where I think we have something to learn from the circus. So if I were to ask you to associate and tell me what comes into your mind when you picture the circus. What would you have to say? What would you see? My guess is this is kind of the image you would get, right? Elephants standing on balls, three rings, dancing poodles, clowns getting out of cars. And for over 100 years, this is what people associated when they thought of the circus. And Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey built a really good, solid business out of this kind of environment. There was only one minor problem. Most people didn't want to go. They didn't like it. And they assumed there were two choices, right? Choice number one is you go to the traditional circus. You see the clowns, you see the dancing poodles, you watch the elephants on the balls, real crowd pleasers, you sit in a dirty tent with sawdust covered floors, and that's your entertainment. Or option two, Option two, which is what 90% of the audience chose, was not going to the circus, right? It was doing something different, doing anything different, as it turns out. They hated the circus. Staying home, playing video games, reading a book, cutting the lawn, painting a fence, painting the neighbor's fence, doing anything but going to the circus. And for years and years, people assumed there were only two choices there. And operators kept building bigger and bigger versions of the traditional circus. So instead of three dancing poodles, now they had four dancing poodles. It was an exciting innovation. Now they had trick ponies that could count out, right? So you had to count out one, two, three, four. Uh, when he got to six, he got a controller's job. When he got to 10, he became a CFO. And everybody thought that was the, that's all you had. You had two choices. But then something radical happened. Somebody looked at the demographics. They looked at the market, and they said, wait a minute. There's got to be a new opportunity. There's got to be a way to tap into this much bigger marketplace. Can anyone tell me who that innovator was? Interestingly, almost everybody told me who that operator was. That operator, of course, is Cirque du Soleil. They came in as disruptors and saw opportunity where others saw limitation. They knew that doing differently, doing better, doing something new, thinking outside the box was a way to reach an audience that was previously untapped. And by the way, what a business they built. I'm guessing that most of you in this room have seen a Cirque presentation. And if you have, you are one of the 150 million people in 300 cities around the world who have seen their presentations in the last 30 years. They achieved revenues in a decade that it took Barnum and & Bailey and Ringling Brothers a century to achieve. 
So how do they do that? How do they think differently? How do they find their way to a new model? Well, they understood there were more than two choices. Now, let's talk about that as it relates to our field. I want you to think about the picture you get in your head if I say retirement community, assisted living, skilled nursing care, memory care, what comes to mind? But I want you to twist that and think a little more closely and think about what your prospective resident or customer has in mind. And I'm guessing that what we picture for our industry is very different from what the potential customer pictures. What the potential customer pictures is what we see up here. Isolation, healthcare, reactionary healthcare, right? We're great at meeting needs. We do it well, we do well, and we do good, and we should be proud of that. But what we're not so great at is finding the wants. It's why we have so much of the market that's so untapped for us. And again, consumers see themselves as having two choices. Choice number one is they move in with us for health care. You break it, we'll take it. You know, you break your hip, we have rehab down the hall for you. You have a heart condition, we have cardiac rehab care. You have memory loss, we have a locked unit behind door number three. Is it any wonder people only want to come with us when they have to? What they really want is, is what they perceive as their sole other option, staying home, staying in their home. But what if that isn't the only two options we have? What if we find our way to a third option that allows them to thrive, that speaks to their hopes, dreams, aspirations, fears around well-aging? And why should we care? Well, we should care because, as Ken Dykewald reminded us yesterday, the biggest opportunity is hiding in plain sight. And there it is. It's the blue ocean opportunity. It's the 90% of the people who aren't going to move into your community or mine today who are looking for something they can't define. And they're looking to us to define it for them. So how do we do that? How do we find our way into this market? How do we create option three? Well, we've partnered with a design thinking firm to do some deep research into the hopes, dreams, and aspirations of the boomers and the people we're all trying to attract and create what we call an emotional roadmap for the community of the future. And notice I didn't use the word retirement community because that word is dead and gone. If it's in your name, get rid of it. So what does option three look like? Well, we've seen three trends that came out of that that will define the community of the future. Number one, it's a move away from social isolation and segregation to deep personal and community connection. It's a move from retirement to re-engagement. And it's a move from reactionary health care to proactive lifestyle management. So let's talk about each of those very briefly. Why is community so important? You know, if you look at the research around well-aging, and let's assume that we have a common agreed upon definition for well-aging. There are a couple things in common. Number one, people who age successfully have deep personal connections, not Facebook connections. I hate to break it to you, but your Facebook friends are not your friends. <laughs> FaceTime is not the same as a one-on-one -on -one conversation. People who age well have deep personal connections. They have deep community connections. And both are critically important. And it was brought home to me when I started in this field nearly 20-some years ago. I was at my first week on the job at a marketing event. A woman came up to me and said, John, I heard the presentation today. I want to sign up. And I thought, this is great. I'm going to make a sale here. My, you know, my star is rising. This is fabulous. So he filled out the paperwork. And I said, Mrs. Jones, what made you decide to move into our community today? And she said, it's simple. For the past six and a half years, I've been having dinner with the same man every night, just the two of us. And she said, you know, I probably shouldn't complain. He dresses well. He's up to date on current events, smart, doesn't smoke or cuss as far as I know. But the simple truth of the matter is, I'm just sick of him and I never want to see him again. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, I, I miss this in orientation, apparently. And so I said, well, let me make sure I understand. You're moving in and, and your husband's staying home. And she said, honey, my husband's been gone for years. I'm talking about Tom Brokaw. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And what she taught me is the value of deep human connection. Watching TV is not being connected. There's a difference between being independent and merely being alone. People yearn for real connection, and it can't just be with their own cohort. We need human connection across the spectrum. It's why people need to be connected to community. So fostering that deep connection is going to be one of the driving forces behind the community of the future. The second one, and you heard Ken Dykewald talk about this as well, the move from retirement to re-engagement. And it's not casual re-engagement. This is real re-engagement. Retirement is a bad word. It's dead. It needs to get buried. I hope the funeral is sometime next week, and I hope you will all be there. If that word is in your thinking or in your name, for all our sakes, I hope you'll get rid of it. What people are looking for is purpose and engagement and interest and real purpose. So we talk about work. For some people, that will be full-time work. For others, it will be part-time work. For others, it will be volunteer. They want to engage in learning, but it's real engagement with the community and with their work. Third, it's a move from reactionary health care to proactive lifestyle management. And no, that does not mean a wellness class. It means, again, fostering the deep connections with the community, with each other, that allow people to age with vitality. And that is a word people will use as they talk about the future. Our communities of the future need to be radically different than they are today. We're not getting the people who are looking for aspirational well-aging. We're getting the people who need health care. We're addressing the needs. We're just not addressing the wants. And if we are going to address the wants, we've got to fundamentally rethink our approach to this field. And it's wide open. The opportunities are endless. If you walk away with nothing else, out of this conference and out of what we do, we are the very people who ought to be leading that charge. There are a lot of people outside this room who are looking at those of us inside this room, and they're just hoping that we're paying attention. They're hoping that we're listening to them. They're hoping that we're listening to what they cannot articulate for themselves and that we will deliver the lifestyle that allows them to age with enthusiasm and security and vitality. It is a big, big ocean of opportunity. We're going in. There's room for everybody. And I hope you'll be joining us. Thank you so much.